Welcome everybody. Uh, people are joining us on Zoom or YouTube uh, onto the Tartan Slam series. I'm very excited to host here today, Dr. Kazra. Uh, he's going to be presenting his uh, the Wildcat Slam from Team Cyro. Uh, Dr. Kazra received his uh, engineer, computer engineering degree from KN2Z University of Technology in 2011, got his PhD from the university in robotics from the University of Technology Sydney in 2017. I was a visiting PhD student with uh, the Department of Computer Science in University of South California. And then before joining CSIRO Data 61, he was at the MIT's Department uh, uh, of Aeronautics and Astronautics in Leeds Laboratory. Uh, and his research has focused primarily on developing robust and reliable algorithms with provable performance guarantees for signal and multi-robot perception and autonomy. And he was a Best Paper Award finalist on NICRA 2018. And as I said before, he represents today Team Cyro, which got second place in the DARPA Sub T challenge after the application of a tiebreaker rule uh, for mere, I guess, one minute or so on submitting the final artifact. But more impressively, and especially for us on the Tartan Slam series, they got a really nice map with uh, by DARPA zone measurement, 0% deviation. And so that's, I guess, what everybody should be excited to hear about. Okay. So thank you, Lucas. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kasra. Uh, I think uh, Lucas spoiled it a little bit, but um, I'm going to talk about our Wildcat SLAM. is a SLAM system we have developed in Cyro. Um, and also, I will be also talking about um, our efforts in the Sub-T challenge. So recently joined Cyro. So most of the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, are really the work of my colleagues here. Um, uh, before I joined Tyra. So before talking about SLAM and our SLAM system, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Cyro itself. So Cyro is Australia's national science agency. Um, it's a very large organization, both in terms of the number of people, uh, the topics that we do research on, uh, number of sites, and the impact we have on Australian economy. Um, so, uh, we do both basic research and we also work with industry um, on industrial projects. Um, perhaps one of the most famous examples of technologies that came out of Cyro is Wi-Fi, which we all use on a regular basis. Um, so we are part of the uh, Robotics and Autonomous Systems Lab group in, within Cyro. Uh, so Navinda, our group leader, is on, on the call. Uh, we basically have uh, more than 80 roboticists, including um, also students, uh, PhD students, undergraduate students. Um, and we have a long history of working in field robotics. This includes land, sea, air, caves, you name it. Um, and other than field robotics, we also work on uh, a very diverse set of topics within robotics. Uh, this includes some things like slam perception uh, to uh, soft robotics to legged robots, um, et cetera. So the video you're seeing just shows uh, basically our campus and some of our facilities here. Um, we're based in Brisbane in Queensland. Um, and you can see uh, again, the tunnel, for example, we had built here for to test and practice uh, for SAPT and some of the other facilities we had. So um, I think everyone here, or most of the most of the audience by now, um, have heard about the DARPA Sub T Challenge. Uh, basically, DARPA has been organizing these robotics challenges since mid two thousand, uh, where they're trying to push uh, the state of the art in various um, subfields of robotics. So the first. Uh, challenges were focused on autonomous driving and that ultimately led to the autonomous driving and self-driving industry that we are witnessing right now. Uh, the, the one after that uh, was focused on humanoid robot. And the one that just ended uh, was the subtraining challenge or sub-T. So the goal in sub-T is to basically send a team of robots uh, that can work autonomously into subtraining environments, whether there are mines, um, caves, um, airborne environments, like for example, um, subway stations, 
where there has been an accident and you don't want to send uh, first responders, human first responders immediately into the scene. You want to be able to send your team of robots to map the environment, um, identify where the victims are, uh, and then you can then send humans, uh, rescuers much more safely and effectively. Um, so this is not only pushing the limits of what we do in terms of robotics research, but also um, it, it's for a good cause. So in the US alone, I think it's estimated there are more than 500 mine accidents. Uh, there, there are a similar number of mining accidents here in Australia and all over the world. So uh, and again, this is one of those opportunities that we can actually have positive impact by saving humans' lives. Um, so our team, uh, as Lucas said, uh, was called uh, Team Cyrodata 61. Uh, so the main part of the team uh, was our group, uh, but we were also partnering with uh, two other partners, MSN, which is a spin out that came out of our group. Uh, they work on drone autonomy and mapping. Um, I'll talk more about them in, in the upcoming slides. We're also partnering with Georgia Tech. The team in Georgia Tech was led by Professor Arkey, and they focused on uh, multi-robot coordination and um, task allocation. Uh, this is uh, the picture of our team in different events. Um, so the first three events, they're focused on one, types of, one type of environment. Uh, so for example, tunnels, um, caves, um, and uh, the airborne types of uh, subterranean environment. And the finals, which is what you see at the bottom right, was basically a combination of all of these uh, types of subterranean environments at once. Um, so again, uh, this is already spoiled, but uh, so the, the final competition had two preliminary rounds uh, and the third day was the actual prize round. So we did very well in the preliminaries. So we were the top team, uh, but as you can see, the competition was quite close. Um, and in the prize run, um, we had the top score together with Team Cerberus uh, from ETH, uh, University of Norway, University of Science and Technology in Norway, and um, Oxford. Uh, but so it all came down to tiebreaker rule. Uh, and as Luca said, uh, we had reported our last successful artifact, which is how you, were, you would get points um, less than a minute or a minute or so uh, after Team Cerberus. Uh, so we got the second place. Uh, very excited, uh, very proud of the team. Uh, this is a picture of our team. Um, and in terms of how we achieved that, so we have been uh, writing papers on the technologies uh, that we developed uh, in our autonomy stack. So you see some of the papers that are already um, published on the left. Uh, so we're writing more papers, including a paper dedicated to our SLAM system. Uh, but uh, you can, if you're interested in these topics, you can look at those papers, but we also have a paper that will appear in the new Field Robotics Journal. Uh, and that basically gives you an overview of the entire autonomy um, stack. Uh, so that's already available in archive, uh, the preprint. Uh, we are also planning to release uh, some of the components uh, of our code base. Uh, so we have already released our occupancy mapping uh, system called O. You can find it on our GitHub. Uh, I've heard that we are planning to release probably one or two more components uh, very quite soon. Uh, so check out our GitHub um, if you're interested. Um, with that, let's get to the SLAM result. Um, so as Lucas said, uh, we had the best SLAM result uh, in the competition. So these are the maps that were generated and submitted to DARPA during the course of uh, prize run. Um, so here green means the points are within a distance of the ground truth that DARPA had, and orange means the points are, uh, uh, have an error more than that um, threshold that DARPA uh, had considered. I think it's uh, several meters. Um, and basically based on that, they defined this deviation matrix and uh, we had 0% deviation, which is impressive. 
Uh, we also covered 91% of the course. Um, I think Team Explorer, they, 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 uh, they covered more, uh, but uh, very proud of our SLAM result. So the way, maybe I mentioned that, but the way you get a score uh, in SAPT is that the, the way it worked is that you had to report a certain number of artifacts. Uh, so you had to detect them and then you had to report the type and location accurately enough to score a point. So you can imagine uh, the SLAM system uh, was essential to be able to do well in the competition. So not only to get the points, but also the fact that you had a team of robots and they had to coordinate and you, ha you should be, you, you had to be able to um, assign tasks and that required sort of a consistent uh, spatial perception um, among the agents we had in the team. So really uh, the SLAM system or the multi-robot SLAM system was uh, very fundamental uh, to, to, to our success. Uh, so this is another fun fact from DARPA. So it turned out that we had the most accurate artifact report. Uh, so in this case, we have less than uh, five centimeter error, which is already at the sensor noise level, which is quite interesting. And you, you can see also a better picture of our map uh, that again was created at the prize run. With that, uh, I'll start talking about um, our, uh, some of the early works that we did in our group on SLAM that ultimately uh, led to the lessons we learned uh, that we eventually incorporate them into the new system we created, uh, which is called Wildcat. So the SLAM research uh, started in CSIRO mainly by the seminal works of Bossy uh, and Zelot. So they were basically uh, trying to do LiDAR initial SLAM uh, uh, continuously, but without stopping in the environment. Uh, so you would just walk uh, in the environment, uh, carry a handheld device like this, the one that you can see in the picture and in the video. Uh, and uh, so you, at the time they had a 2D laser scanner, but with the spring mechanism that you can see in the device, uh, you could you were able to essentially create 3D maps and um, and get uh, results that you see in the video. So this technology uh, was eventually commercialized in 2014 uh, by GeoSlam. So we use this technology in our group for research. Um, so so our SLAM research didn't stop there. So if you look at our website, uh, there, there are a number of papers where we have um, improved this work. Um, particular the work of my colleague Pema Mogadam and his students uh, in um, between, I guess, 2016, 17, 18 timeframe, uh, uh, they have managed to, to uh, make interesting improvements to this. Um, so here you're seeing an outside, outdoor example in one of the mountains here in Brisbane, where Mike is carrying the sensor and if I just skip the video, um, you get a result like this. So at the time we had to process it offline, uh, but uh, it, it was a very nice work. So, so this device is, uh, was invented by Mike Bossy, Robert Zillard, and also one of our colleagues, Paul Flick. So with this device, as I said, you could move in the environment and uh, create gorgeous results like this. So the one in the right is the Tower of Pisa in Italy. Um, and the one uh, you see on the left is the, the Alcatraz um, prison island in California in the US. And these are the maps they could generate with a 2D laser scanner uh, on this device, which we call Zebedee. So learning the lessons, uh, Learning lessons from our work, uh, the work that was started by Mike and Robert, um, and also incorporating ideas from their work uh, led to the creation of a new system called Wildcat. So Wildcat is also planned to spin out soon uh, from our SIRE group. Um, so Wildcat was matured uh, during the course of SUBT um, and also through an early adopter program where the Volcat team uh, worked with um, a few companies 
Uh, and these companies essentially use Wildcat on a regular basis every day. Uh, so, so through these uh, programs, through SOFT and also the early adopter program, um, Wildcat uh, evolved heavily. Um, so two of the examples of these companies, I've listed them here. So MSN uh, is the, one of our partners in the SOFT, the spin out from Syro. As I said, they work on drone autonomy and drone mapping. Uh, the other company is Odormap. Uh, they also work on rapid mapping for asset documentation and asset management. Uh, so they have these um, devices. Uh, so MSN has Hovermap, which is something you can attach to a drone or carry it handheld. Uh, and basically it has a Velodyne uh, that's spinning uh, in IMU and runs Wildcat. Similarly, Automap has Terrace M, which is based on the sensor pack we designed for sub T, uh, and again, runs Wildcat uh, to, to be able to process the point clouds and the IME measurements. Um, so these are now commercially available through these companies. Um, but just to give you an example of uh, types of results you can get with uh, these uh, these sensor packs and uh, the types of work that these companies do. Uh, so on the left, you see videos from MSN, uh, where the bottom left is a construction site on the ground. Uh, the top left is an oil rig. Uh, on the right, you see uh, a map collected in Brisbane uh, by just putting the sensor pack Terrace M on top of a car and just driving around. Uh, without using GPS. Uh, and uh, the gorgeous result you see on bottom right is basically uh, a place nearby where I'm currently talking to you from. Uh, and you get these again, gorgeous maps, um, very sharp um, edges, if, if you can see that, um, by just uh, carrying the device. So maybe I'll just let this play a bit. So if I go to the end, get a good picture of the entire oil rig. And here also, you can see the whole construction site. Um, yeah, really nice. So I'll move on. Uh, so in the top uh, we had all types of robots. We use them in uh, different events. Uh, but the decision we made, which in hindsight was a great decision, was to use the same uh, perception system on all of them, uh, in particular for SLAM. So the hardware we were using is something we designed, which I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, it's called CatPack. Uh, I'll talk more about it soon. But basically, it's based on a spinning uh, Velodyne mounted at an angle. And um, so if you look at all these robots, they all have a cat pack on them. So our drones are carrying a different form factor of uh, this concept, which is the hover map uh, payload that I described that comes from Amazon. Uh, so from the robots you see here, uh, the DTRs and the hexapods are also made uh, and designed uh, in our group. Uh, I think we use them in the some of the earlier events um, of so. But inside the cat packs, we have four cameras. Uh, but we're not using the cameras to do SLAM. Uh, we use them, of course, for object detection, and we can also use them for point cloud colorization. Um, so we have a Velodyne, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is an IMU uh, and the Velodyne is mounted at a 45 degree and it spins around the vertical axis. Uh, and there is an NVIDIA Jetson Xavier that basically uh, we use to run our Wildcat uh, system on. Uh, so if you look at right, you see the field of view of the sensors. So of course you see the field of view of the cameras. But if you look at the sphere, this is basically uh, what we get out of cat pack. Um, of course, without the uh, top and so the North Pole and South Pole cones. Um, so this is a lot of data. I think that gave us an advantage, uh, but also 
great amount of data comes a lot of issues and responsibility. So I'll then talk about our SLAM system and basically how we manage to process uh, all this data. So this is an overview of the SLAM system that we're using uh, in, uh, in sub T. So our Wildcat implementation has other components as well, can process various types of measurements um, and has an offline optimization phase as well. But here I'm just focusing on a big overview of the components that was relevant to what we did in sub T. So in sub T, uh, just a quick overview, uh, we were processing IMU and LIDAR measurements. We were incorporating them into a sliding window local optimization. Uh, where we were optimizing uh, the trajectory and using the optimized trajectory, we're optimizing the local map uh, that we saw within the window. And then every, say, five seconds, we would uh, pack this local map uh, or sub map, uh, and then that would remain rigid. Um, so the local optimization basically produced our odometry. Then these sub maps were matched uh, with one another to find loop closures. And then with the odometry and the loop closures, we could uh, create a post graph optimization problem and solve it. So the nodes of the post graphs um, would correspond to the frames that represent each of these rigid sub maps. Uh, and the edges come again from odometry or the matching we did between these sub maps. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into how the system works. So we, from the point cloud, we extract serifals. So we don't uh, work with raw point cloud. Um, so you can think of serifals as basically our features. So to extract these serifals, first of all, we do extract them at multiple resolutions. But at, at any resolution, we voxelize the points. And then we essentially compute the mean and covariance of the points uh, within each voxel. Um, so the covariance matrix will base and the mean uh, basically describe an ellipsoid. Uh, so the mean describes uh, where the center of this ellipsoid is and the covariance describes the shape of this uh, ellipsoid. Uh, and the features we use to match uh, in, in our local optimization uh, and later for loop closure detection is basically uh, planar uh, serifolds. We can compute uh, a score to describe how planar each of these serifolds are. Uh, so this can be done by looking at the spectrum of the covariance matrix, which corresponds to the length of the axes uh, of your ellipsoid you can see on the right. Uh, and just intuitively, if two of these axes are larger than uh, the third one, uh, you can think of that ellipsoid being uh, closer to be to being a planar surface uh, rather than a sphere or, or a cylinder. Um, so these uh, planar ones were essentially our features. So if you look at the figure at the bottom right, uh, we are, I think, um, coloring uh, the surfaces based on how planar they look. Uh, and I think green means uh, th these were like the ideal features. Um, so in the local optimization, uh, window-based optimization that we solve, we have to be able to match these serifolds. So here I'm just telling you how we do that. So the descriptors we use uh, to basically find uh, matchings between these uh, serifolds is basically described by the time. So the average times of the points that created that serifold the centroid of that, that serifold, which is the mean of the points you had within that voxel, uh, and also the normal vector, which again, you can estimate by looking at the spectrum. So in particular, the eigenvector corresponding to that um, smaller axis, it gives you uh, an estimate of the normal. Uh, so you can see that again, the middle figure with that uh, green arrow. Then uh, when we want to match them, we do uh, an approximate nearest neighbor search to basically look for, in this descriptor space, to look for similar surface. And uh, later in the optimization, we need to basically create a, an error term uh, into our total objective function. Uh, and that comes from a point to plane style 
cost, which is basically looking at uh, the distances between uh, the matched serifals, but projected onto the uh, along the serifal normal. Uh, so along the one-dimensional subspace spanned by the serifal normal. Uh, so that's a very standard technique. Um, so now that you know about the serifals and how, to, how do we match the serifals, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our lighting window trajectory optimization. So we do an alternating minimization similar to ICP, where we uh, alternate between um, matching the serifals, so finding correspondences between the serifals, and then an optimization stage where we optimize the trajectory and as a result of that, uh, optimizing the serifals that are rigidly attached uh, to our poses. Um, so if you look at the loop that you see here, uh, at any point, uh, we at, at any iteration, outer iteration, we start with uh, creating these serifals. We recompute our matchings based on the current estimate of the trajectory. And then we solve an optimization problem uh, within that window. So the, term, the objective function of that optimization problem has two types of cost terms, uh, mainly. One of them comes from the IMU readings within that window. And the other one comes from uh, the serial matching cost terms, which I described in the previous slide, uh, the point to plane style um, error terms. And then we optimize the trajectory, and then we go back and adjust, readjust the serifals again um, and do the optimization again. Create the new cost terms uh, based on the new matches and optimize the trajectory and do that again and again for a fixed number of times. And then we slide the window, and then we continue doing that again and again. So two challenges that exist in um, in SLAM systems, especially when you have different types of sensors like that asynchronously reduce measurements, uh, firing at different rates, is that you have to like make hard decisions about uh, what are the poses that you're trying to estimate. Uh, so are you going with your fastest sensor? Are you going with the slowest sensor? Uh, what do you do in between? How do you align the timings of the measurements? Uh, so this is always a challenge, but in particular, it's a challenge uh, in the case of uh, our system where we use IMUs um, and, and LIDARs. It's particularly a challenge, uh, especially also because of the fact that you can get distortion when you're using LIDAR and when you're moving in the environment. So Tim Barfu, I think, described the problem very well a few weeks ago. So uh, I invite you to go check that out. Um, Basically, we have that problem twice here because not only within the LiDAR, uh, we have a mechanism that's spinning, uh, but also the, the LiDAR itself on the cat pack is spinning. It's really crucial to be able to, to uh, handle the distortions you get uh, because of the motion of the sensor and the motion of the robot. So a solution uh, to both of these problems uh, is basically to try to use a time representation for this optimization problem. Um, so here I'm just giving you the big idea. So our implementation is slightly different. You can find the details in, um, in Mike and Rob's paper. Uh, but essentially the high level idea is the following. So instead of, um, instead of thinking about discrete poses to represent your trajectory, you can think of a smooth curve that you see here, uh, which essentially is a mapping from um, the set of reels, uh, so the time, to uh, a pose, uh, uh, a point in the SE3 manifold. Uh, and you can think of a smooth curves that describe your trajectory, but you can think of a specific family of these smooth curves that are parameterized by a set of parameters called theta. So if I give you a theta, then you would have a curve that so then you can query at different times and get a pose uh, uh, for, for each time. Now, if you parameterize the decision variables in your optimum, if you basically pick this theta uh, or really the class of these terms, the family of the curves um, as your decision variables in the optimization problem, 
uh, instead of just a set of discrete poses that you have arbitrarily uh, chosen. Uh, what you can do is that you can then incorporate all measurements, uh, all asynchronous measurements uh, in a very natural way. So imagine that I have a sensor model uh, where I collected a measurement at some arbitrary time ti. Uh, then the way I incorporated into my optimization problem is that I will have a term where I'm looking at the misalignment between the collected measurements uh, at that arbitrary time and what I expected to get if I was uh, query the curve at time ti. So really the decision variables here, they are the, the parameters of the curve. So you can do that, for example, with cubic B splines and theta, for example, would include uh, the control points of, of your B spline. And basically this addresses the two challenges that, that I mentioned. It also helps you to control the complexity of your optimization problem. So although we are incorporating all the measurements within the window, uh, the number of the size of uh, uh, normal equations we have to solve you know, to solve the nonlinear list of squares is essentially given by the size of theta, the parameters that describe the curve. Uh, there are a lot of details, so you have to be able to do that. Um, uh, you have to generalize. You, you have to be able to generalize, for example, these splines to uh, from uh, linear spaces to, uh, for example, Lie groups. Uh, there's been a lot of research that so this problem also arises in uh, Visual Slam when you're working with uh, rolling shutter cameras. Um, so there's a very uh, rich literature. So um, again, um, I'll, if you're interested, uh, I think um, Tim Barfoot's talk was also uh, a very great introduction to this problem, but also uh, their set of techniques that use Gaussian process to, to describe uh, this uh, continuous time representation. But after we do that local optimization, uh, every five seconds, or after we really optimize that part of the map, we basically pack up that uh, rigid sub map and uh, use that as a node in our post graph optimization formulation. Uh, so Again, we have already computed the geometry from the local window optimization. Then the only thing we have to do is to find loop closures. To be able to guess where to search for loop closures, we can use global descriptors or just look at our estimates and take into account the uncertainties and do some form of gating uh, with Mahalovic distances. And once we uh, find a potential loop closure, we can find the actual transform, the relative uh, transform between the corresponding frames uh, using point-to-plane -plane ICP, again, between the several submaps. Uh, so once you have that, you get uh, your uh, post graph. Uh, so a, a cartoon is shown on the right, where uh, the nodes are the decision variables of your optimization problems are basically these poses that represent these submaps and uh, the edges represent your noisy odometry measurements or loop closure measurements. Um, so something we do that's slightly different from vanilla post graph is that once in a while, we try to merge the sub maps, the nodes of the post graph that they have a lot of overlap. So the idea here is that uh, you don't want the complexity of the problem to increase with the length of the trajectory, but rather you want it to uh, be proportional to the size of the environment. So if two nodes have a lot of overlap, uh, you can merge them um, and use that merge sub map as, as a new node in your graph. Uh, and we, uh, of course, use M estimators to try to uh, deal with the outliers that we cannot filter um, through some of the steps we have before. So this is a video of our postgraph optimization. So the colored regions you see are the submaps, the circle submaps that we have. And the frames you see are essentially the frames that represent the um, origin or the root of, of each of those submaps. Uh, and as you can see, uh, when you detect loop closures, you optimize the postgraph and uh, your trajectory gets corrected. So the idea is basically that your local window optimization uh, does a very good job in locally optimizing uh, the, the map and the trajectory, 
but you inevitably have drift in the long run. And then the postgraph optimization and the loop closure detection we have there basically puts these stop maps in their right location uh, at the global scale. But so far, what I've described is a single robot uh, SLAM system. So the way we did it in sub T to, to do the multi robot SLAM part uh, is basically very, very natural. Um, basically, what we were doing is that we were sharing the stop maps these robots were creating with each other. So each robot was simply broadcasting their stop maps, and we were trying to synchronize it uh, across the team. And then effectively, what this does is that each robot was solving uh, the whole joint postgraph optimization uh, separately. Uh, so this ended up working well because, in part, because uh, all the robots start at the same location in sub -T, which is again an assumption that you can make in many of the um, real uh, rescue missions. Uh, so I think that simplified the problem a little bit. Um, we also have a very good odometry uh, at the scale of sub-T. So I think that also helped a lot to deal with the fact that uh, depending on how when robots could communicate with each other, maybe uh, some of their robots, some of the robots had outdated postgraph optimization problems that they were solving because they were missing some of the submaps. Um, so talk more about these challenges and, and uh, the next steps in terms of collaborative SLAM, but really um, with the design we had of, uh, uh, for, for Wildcat, the multi-robot followed very naturally. Uh, the multi-robot setting followed very naturally. So uh, this is now, I'm just showing you uh, the communication links we have between the robots. So each red node is uh, a robot and the color of these links uh, is uh, how good, how strong uh, was the link we had between the robots. Uh, when, the, when they get red, it means that uh, effectively we couldn't get much data um, from the robot. And what happened is that one of the robots, one of the spots, uh, went very deep and explored the cave. Uh, so, I'm oh, sorry. Um, our operator who's sitting here uh, couldn't, uh, didn't know about this part of the environment until very late. Uh, and now if you think of the postgraph optimization, now this robot has an outdated postgraph, doesn't have a lot of new soft maps that are created here. So, so that could that could create uh, issues, of course. Um, but this is really a property of the problem, by the way. Uh, the fact that you cannot communicate uh, uh, in in certain uh, times uh, that's really one of the challenges in collaborative SLAM, uh, where you, you would want to synchronize uh, as frequently as you can, but uh, there might be periods of disconnect where um, the solutions, the problems that the robots are solving actually are different problems. Thus, you can have uh, issues coming from that. So if I go to the next slide, uh, so maybe I have to skip this for the interest of time, uh, but basically this is the same uh, scenario. Uh, uh, here we are showing the artifacts and the artifacts that uh, we reported correctly and we got a score for them. So these are the huge balls. Uh, so I described this already, but what is interesting here is that we're seeing this now from the perspective of the operator, uh, from the perspective of the base station. And you can see that this robot bingo is already beyond uh, the communication reach of the base station. So although bingo is expanding its own map, uh, we have no clue about that uh, until we gradually we get connected to that with uh, through one of the other robots. And then well, one thing that happened is that uh, we, all of our robots, they got stuck at the end uh, and less than 10 minutes, uh, we had uh, 21 points and we had only one functional robot and that was the true MVP. And then uh, it managed to come here and rescue the data and we scored the, the, the final point. Uh, so very cool. Um, it's an overview of our approach. 
Um, I'm not going to repeat it, but I've highlighted some of the key characteristics of our solution. Um, something that I men not, didn't mention was um, the online calibration we do. So we, we calibrate we, in that optimization problem we have. Not only we have basically the care that we are um, optimizing, uh, the continuous trajectory that we are optimizing, but also all types, all sorts of extrinsic transforms, uh, IM devices, et cetera. Um, so this is a final map uh, that we produced after DARPA, after the SEPT final, um, finals of the SEPTI challenge. Uh, so they're colorized by the robots. So the gray is the grand truth produced by DARPA. Uh, you can't see much of gray because uh, our map is uh, very good. Um, you can see the areas that we couldn't explore on the top. Um, yeah, so, so very cool. And this is the cave. The bottom right is the carry where one of our robots uh, went deep inside it and we lost communications with it. So this is a fly through video uh, of the course uh, during that we created after the uh, finals. Uh, so you can see some of the artifacts here. Uh, this is a very cool video. Um, just watch it together. Skip a little bit. So there's a victim here. Very cool. Um, so this is a similar flight through video for the Airborne event. Um, so I'll just skip it for the interest of time. So you get an overview here. Um, so as I said, we are planning to write a paper about Wildcat. So uh, the CAPAC design system we had, that, that's great. Uh, but we're also trying to do evaluation using existing data sets with non-spinning um, LIDARs. Uh, so this is uh, results from uh, Mulran data sets. Uh, this is from Kais, uh, Iron Kim's group, uh, Gizep King and his colleagues. Uh, so I'll just quickly play that. There's a car driving. Uh, we have a loop closure event here, another loop closure. Um, and this is essentially the final map. Uh, we are computing uh, metrics and benchmark and comparing it with the state of the art uh, for the upcoming paper. Uh, the data that we are collecting, we just collected a few days ago in, in our campus. Uh, so it has areas where we go inside the buildings, multiple floors, like open areas. There's a communication tower here, lots of trees. Um, Unfortunately, we ran out of battery here, so we couldn't uh, close the bigger loop. Uh, but so this is part of the tunnels that we created to, to practice for sub T. You can see how sharp the um, tunnels are. Um, but what we are trying to do effectively is to, we've mounted these targets that you can see on the right throughout the campus. And uh, a third party has uh, surveyed these points, so we have accurate uh, locations of these. And then we are also marking them in our maps. And then we can do a proper evaluation uh, of how accurate our solutions are. So you can also see me behind one of these targets wearing a lot of reflective helmets to protect myself from spiders and snakes and everything we have here. So I'll finish by just talking about uh, Collaborative Slam. Um, so Collaborative SLAM is an active area of research in SLAM. Um, uh, for the younger uh, researchers, if you're looking for a problem, I invite you to go check this out. Uh, so basically, you need to be able to do uh, some form of Collaborative SLAM every time you have a multi-robot task in unknown GPS-denied environments. Stop so was one example, but really there are many of these examples. Um, from autonomous cars to um, underwater robots, uh, you name it. Um, so this is important because 
again, to be able to collaborate at any level, you need to have a consistent understanding of um, the, the space around you. So you can talk to other robots about the same location in the space. And that is what you get from Collaborative Slam. Another cool feature of Collaborative Slam is what I describe as one for all, all for one, which basically means that uh, so in SLAM, in single robot SLAM, you close a loop, you get a correction in your trajectory, and that's already super cool. But when you have multiple robots, you can get help from other robots to improve your own trajectory estimate. So if another robot is closing loops in its own trajectory, possibly at a very different time, uh, that information essentially is propagated to uh, all the other agents' uh, estimates of their own maps and trajectory. So, so uh, you can think of using that in real scenarios where, for example, um, some of the autonomous cars in the street are tasked with closing loops and uh, reducing the uncertainty of others that are operating uh, uh, to do other tasks, for example, uh, taking passengers to their destination. Um, there's a recent nice survey paper uh, from uh, the from University of Technique Montreal. Um, I think that gives you a good introduction of um, uh, the state of the art in the field. Um, so, but at a high level, if you think about the problem, uh, you can divide it into front end and back end. So, in the front end, the main challenge is to try to find inter-robot loop closure detection, uh, to find inter-robot loop closures which are essentially loop closures between the robots. And the main challenge there is uh, the efficiency of sharing this. So finding good policies for exchanging data, that's quite important. Uh, Davide Skarmitsos group has looked at this. Many other groups have looked at this. Uh, we also at MIT uh, looked at this. So together with my um, colleagues, uh, Matt Gamow and John Howe, um, and also with uh, Yil and Tian, um, we've looked at this problem. The other challenge you have on the front end side is being robust to outliers. So typically to be able to robot to have some level of outlier robustness, you need, have, you need to have a good initial guess of your trajectory. And when you have multiple robots, sometimes this is missing. In the sub T, we did how we share the same initial frame with the other robots. So that problem was a bit easier, but in real life, uh, this is a case where you to verify whether something is an outlier or not, you want to have a good initial, you require a good uh, in relative, you need to have a good understanding of the relative transforms, but uh, you don't have it um, just because you're seeing the robot for the first time. On the back end side, uh, when it comes to post graph formulations, you basically have to decide which architecture you're using to solve your joint pose graph. Uh, so one option would be a centralized solution where basically the robot send their data or some representation of that data back to a base station and the base station simply solves a large single robot pose graph optimization problem. Um, so I think Margarita Klee, uh, they have developed very good systems, uh, centralized systems. I think she talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, but basically the, the decision between these types of architecture depends on the applications. Some are applications or whenever you can do centralized, you should decentralize. But uh, there are some problems, uh, for example, maybe you in certain, in many applications, you don't have access to, uh, to uh, a reliable communication link to the base station. Uh, the other problem is in terms of robustness of the system. So in some application, if the base station goes down, the entire system goes down. Um, so the alternative uh, architectures are, is, for example, what we did in sub -T, And I assume some of the other teams also had a similar architecture, which are called distribution by replication. In this case, you're distributing the problem among the robots but you're essentially giving a full copy of the full problem to each robot to solve. So again, in some settings, this is the right thing to do. In SAPT, given the scale, given the fact that we had good odometry, given the fact that we had a good initial frame that was shared by all the robots at the beginning, um, I think that that makes this solution work. 
the periods of disconnect in this setting was relatively small and odometry was already good enough to, um, to give good estimates to robots. Uh, and then the, the, the other end of the spectrum would be essentially distributed and decentralized optimization algorithms. Uh, which is something I've explored with my colleagues, Yulin Tian, uh, David Rosen, and John Howe at MIT. Um, so in this case, each robot essentially not solving directly for the poses of the other robots, uh, but rather to solving for their own variables, their own poses, but exchanging messages through an optimization algorithm, through a distributed optimization algorithm, so that eventually all of them converge to the solution uh, they would have had if they're solving the full joint pose graph optimization problem. Um, so you see some examples here where the colors are, represent different robots uh, and you're seeing uh, as we converge to the solution. So in this, I uh, invite you to check out our, our work. Uh, basically we have some global optimality guarantees in the distributed setting. Uh, despite the fact that the problem is non-convex. Uh, but basically the challenge in the distributed and decentralized setting is that you have to inevitably uh, use uh, first order methods for your optimization problem. So um, that can uh, make the convergence a bit slow if you're not careful. Uh, so here we have tried to, to use um, acceleration schemes to try to improve the convergence, but still it's gonna be slower than uh, the convergence rate you get with centralized solvers. Um, so I've had the paper down below. We've released a code for this, um, check that out. And uh, with that, I'm ready to take questions. Um, so I, I do wanna thank our group for the Volcat team, uh, Gavin Cat, uh, Fred Pauling and the rest of the Volcat team are really uh, the folks that were designing Volcat uh, and our, our, our sub-T team and my colleagues, Mila, Jason, Paolo, and Navina. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Kadra. Very nice, very nice presentation. We have a bunch of questions that I'll start now. Sure. One interesting question, very specific maybe, it's, uh, how well does the point to plane cost term generalize to non planar environments like caves? So I, I noticed uh, uh, you used the SERFO and we were expecting before the, the challenge, like, I mean, we were, we were not expecting much, I guess. We, were, we didn't know what to expect. So there was the urban, the cave and, and, and the, the tunnel environment. How well does it work on all these kinds of environments? Is there so, anything? Yes, yeah, so I think in hindsight, uh, it worked quite well. Uh, but basically we have some level of robustness there. So first of all, in the, I think in the code, uh, we are able to also not only look at um, planar cell ferals, but also the cylindrical cell ferals. And we have a corresponding cost term for that. I don't think in the sub T we were using that in our optimization. Um, but basically what we do when we are trying to match these therefalls and create cost terms in the local optimization, we basically, uh, we are doing it at a multiple resolution. So we have a pyramid scheme and then we use, uh, so basically we use all the matchings we can get at different scales, uh, but uh, we assign a weight to these term cost terms according to how the, the how planar they are. So something proportional to the smallest eigenvalue of the LF selection. So effectively you're incorporating all the matches you can get, but uh, you assign a higher weight to ones that uh, we're close to being a, a planar serifal. Uh, so it's not that we don't use anything, uh, we still incorporate all the matches, but we assign these weights based on sort of how close to that to a reliable patch of therapists they were. Cool. Uh, yeah, another question that yeah, maybe stems from that one uh, is how, because eventually the low, the, 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 the front end will feed into the back end. Uh, how do you estimate the uncertainty from, from the surface matching process so that you, you carry that over information to the, to the post graph optimization? So, Basically, as I said, uh, 
when you think of the nonlinear least square problem that we solve uh, to be able to match these things. Um, so we assign these uncertainty weights, the uncertainties, which you can think of them as an information term uh, and inverse of that would correspond to your uh, standard deviation or the, uh, the variance or the covariance. Uh, so that essentially is our basically way of describing how accurate each of those measurements are. Uh, it, and uh, then when you solve the nonlinear least of squares, uh, so this is typical in a linear, uh, typical linear Gaussian estimation problems. In this case, it's a nonlinear Gaussian. But effectively, after you solve the IC, after you solve the matching uh, with these measurement uh, information or measurement covariances you have, you are able to get also expressed the answer, convert that through computing uh, the information matrix. So you look at the uh, sort of the matrix you have in your normal equation, so the, based on the Jacobians and the uncertainties you have in the circle matrix. And the inverse of that essentially gives you the covariance matrix for the resulting transform you're getting. Um, uh, so, so this is typical, this is, this is very similar to what you do into normal ICP, uh, but the difference here is that we are again doing it between circles and the uncertainty we get for each circle of measurements comes from uh, that smallest eigenvalue and how close that circle is to, to a planar cell. Cool, thanks. Uh, another question from, from the chat, I think it's Egypt. Uh, isn't it better doing the joint optimization of the pose and the surface instead of the alternating minimiza minimization scheme? What is the downside of doing the joint optimization in that case? So the seraphils are really attached to our continuous trajectory, right? So the seraphil is collected at some arbitrary time, uh, like the average of the time of the points that created that seraphil. And that's a pose that, again, you can query that curve and it's really a pose. We don't have direct access to that pose, but there was a pose of the sensor at a particular time that led to that, that seraphil. Um, what we are doing in that alternating minimization is we are essentially alternating between the correspondences. So these are effectively discrete variables. This is similar to what you do, for example, in ICP, where what you're alternating between is a continuous optimization problem over your continuous variables. Uh, and then, so that would be the one side of the alternation. The other side of your alternating minimization would be then to say, okay, I'll update my guess for the, high, for the matching, the correspondences. So really it's a mixed continuous discrete problem and, um, and the circles are really attached to the trajectory rigidly. But once we update the trajectory, the circles are automatically corrected because uh, they're attached to a pose in a rigid way. Okay. I guess let's jump to the collaborative part. I have one question. Uh, sure. yeah, how, how do you handle the risk that one bad agent uh, can contaminate the multi-robot slam? Like, uh, I, get, I'm, I think this may have occurred in some other uh, situations at sub-T uh, where maybe one single bad uh, result that just maybe causes some catastrophic failure for other robots. So how do you separate? In sub T, I can, uh, or for Team Explorer, I can tell you we, we, we didn't use uh, a multi-robot solution. We just let each one do their own thing. So I see. Yeah. that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, so I think that's, that problem is a real problem from my discussion with our team. So I think we had a very elaborate set of rules to try to avoid that. Um, so we're very careful to avoid that. But in terms of formulation, in the ideal case, uh, if you have enough outlier robustness built into your optimization problem, uh, you should be able to avoid that. So uh, you may need something beyond uh, the MS, typical MS estimators we use to try to downweight uh, some of the edges and detect outlier measurements. Uh, but in theory, uh, in principle, you can, like if you want to be robust to that, to these types of errors, you should bake that into your optimization problem. So you can, you know, turn off variables or turn off edges if they seem uh, very off 
compared to the, what the rest of the graph is telling you. In practice, though, I think that was a real problem. And I think that had happened to us before. And I think uh, in the finals, we were really careful to, you know, um, to avoid these types of si the situations that can lead to the, these, these types of events. So I think some of the robots from other teams, when they were crashing really bad, suddenly there was something uh, registered incorrectly, and then that could have uh, destroyed everyone's map. And uh, I think that contributed to some of the maps we saw in reported by DARP. Yeah, another question, I guess, like maybe follow up is that, is that uh, how, which uh, Carlos posted here on YouTube, how does your lemma algorithm handle dynamic objects? Because you know that when one robot sees another robot in the field or something, it might might be an issue or other kind of dynamic obstacle. Maybe if it's a, a problem for your systems, like there wasn't sub T, like fog, or or the dynamic uh, obstacles that they created or stuff like that. How is how do you handle that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So thing. In theory, so when you're dealing with uh, dynamics, so, so SLAM is sort of based on an implicit or explicit assumption that the world is static. Um, so really the two major ways that you can deal with that is if you decide to track all the dynamic stuff around the world, uh, around you. Um, so that has been done before. Uh, so for example, in target tracking literature, you explicitly try to target, to track um, uh, the dynamic stuff. The other way would be just to try to filter them out. <laughs> so, and uh, reduce the problem back to the static world setting. Um, so I, I, so I think if, I, if I'm not mistaken, our solution was definitely the second one. Uh, and we have a set of rules, basically heuristics to say, uh, if a circle looks uh, unreliable uh, based, on, based on some heuristics, to drop them or not use the match. But really, like if uh, you can create a situation where, where these set of heuristics fail. So like if, if all the robots were moving right in front of each other, I think definitely we would have, a, uh, we would have had a much worse result. So I think you're Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, another question from Abhishek, I think. Uh, for high fidelity maps in collaborative SLAM settings, do you need to have a fully connected communication graph or having fully connected subgraphs with sparse links between subgraphs suffices? It's a very specific question. Yeah, so the communication really is, is the main challenge. Like the fact that you cannot, you know, so if I had infinite uh, capability to communicate infinite amount of data, the multi-robot setting would essentially be, would reduce to the single robot setting. So that's really the challenge. Um, so in the paper we had uh, with Yilin and David uh, and John Howe, uh, basically uh, we are making some simplifying assumptions about the nature of the network. Uh, we are assuming that, uh, so our focus is on solving the problem. So given the distributed optimization problem, how to solve that to global optimality to try to match some of the results, uh, certifiable algorithms that exist for a single robot case. Um, but in reality, you would have these problems where the problems could diverge if you get you have two clusters, for example, or multiple clusters of communicating robots. Um, and also uh, the bandwidth would be a real problem, for example, for loop closure detection. Uh, but so one step, so one way of trying to incorporate these more realistic models is to also take into account the notion of the, the impact of delay on your optimization. So a simple optimization problem, so algorithm may require synchronous iterations, which means that you're assuming all the robots at the kth round will uh, do this iteration and then they all together go to the next round. Uh, so my, my collaborator, collaborator Yilin uh, Tian, he has looked at an extension of the work that I mentioned where he's also taking into account delays. So with the assumption of bounded delay, which is something that can come out of the types of different topologies of the network, 
that, uh, that you described in that question, uh, we can still modify the algorithm and prove that it will still converge to uh, a neighborhood of the solution. And if, if your delay is less than such, if your maximum delay is less than such, you, you're still able to converge to a stationary point of the optimization problem that we're trying to solve. So basically, uh, these are really the, the, the boundaries uh, uh, when it comes to collaborative and distributed post-graph optimization. And really, these are the problems that we are planning to look at here in um, Syro, and we, we were doing that. And my collaborators are doing it um, at MIT and a few other places, which you can find them in that um, nice survey paper that I mentioned. And just one last question. I know you're completely different time zone, and that's interesting. Uh, but and also a question that we debate uh, here on this Tartan Slam series a little bit is, uh, so Wildcat Slam showed on DARPA challenge, like 0% deviation, almost what we call a perfect score. Does that mean that laser odometry, laser-based odometry solved? What do you, is that your, what do you think for the future? What, what do, where do you go from here? Uh, I, I know you yourself, as you just said, doing a lot of work on collaborative Slam, but just for the single robot, do you think that's solved? So I think the question of whether SLAM is solved or not, uh, I think that there was a nice interview uh, with Sebastian Throne and uh, I forgot who else was there, but Udo Frez, uh, there's a nice article, if you can search it, you can find it. And the title of the, artif the article is, uh, I think there was an interview with Jose Neira and Sebastian Throne, where basically they were discussing whether SLAM is solved or not. And that's at least more than 10 years ago. Uh, so that question has always been around, but if you make the question more specific, if you say, if we, do we have reliable solutions to LiDAR inertial odometry? I think we do, and I think that that, that showed up. Uh, but then it also depends on the level of reliability you're looking after. So we do have solutions that work really out of the box so uh, I've witnessed uh, how Wildcat works here. And it's really uh, easy to collect a new data set and just uh, see the results immediately. Uh, and it, it looks great. Uh, so I think that's one level of reliability. But when it comes to, for example, putting it on um, system like safety critical systems, you still have some more fundamental challenges, which are more, rely more related to what I describe as the algorithmic reliability. Uh, so something related to the paper that I mentioned is, for example, the fact that in robotics, in perception, we are solving all the all sorts of non-convex problems. And we have all types of heuristics, alternating minimizations, et cetera. So there is no real, in general, a priori, there is no guarantee that you're actually finding the correct solution. You're converging to the global minimum uh, so it all depends on how good your initialization was, uh, et cetera, and uh, how much luck you had on that day. Uh, so really, although the engineering part and the basic parts of the algorithm, I think uh, that's, that's solved. Implementations are as a solved problem to a good degree. Really, you're still relying on some level of luck, which becomes important if you're putting it on safety critical systems. Uh, so some of the new effort, efforts, for example, the one that I mentioned in the distributed setting, uh, David Rosen and Luca Carlona's pre previous work for the single robot setting, uh, and, and some of the other works, for example, from uh, Luca's group. Uh, basically, these are examples where you're trying to have provable performance guarantees uh, for, for the problem that you're solving for certain algorithms, at least in some nominal setting. Uh, I think that would be, that is really the missing degree of reliability in robotics, but in particular in perception. So, so trying to extract some of the reliability and performance guarantees you have in control uh, and put them into perception. Perception is harder, you're dealing with real data, um, all sorts of things. Uh, but, uh, but I think that sort of direction that is less explored, but uh, fortunately uh, these days it's becoming popular. 
And I think that would be the missing piece, especially when you're thinking about high risk scenarios and safety critical systems. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, talk and the patience thanks. to answer the questions. It was really great. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll be seeing each other again, maybe on the sub T challenge summit. On, yeah. On yeah. Uh, but for today, thank you very much, everybody yeah. that, that, that showed up. The, the talk will be on YouTube. Maybe we're gonna send, there was some more questions. We may be sending them to you on an email and then you share that before people discord. Sure, sure. Uh, but yes, thank you very much. Thanks. See you guys soon. Yeah.